Um, so several years ago, I decided that I wanted to get into better shape as well as get outside of my comfort zone a little bit. And so one of the things I ended up deciding to do was to sign up for classes um, at one of the local martial arts gyms. So this was kind of challenging for me, um, especially at first. I didn't really play any sports uh, when I was a kid. And so you can imagine that this was really kind of jumping into the deep end. Um, but I kept at it and I persisted. And you know, over time, I started to see that I was getting a little bit better. I was starting to improve. And one of the things that the coaches would say to us more and more as we improved was that when we were practicing techniques or when we were, for example, um, hitting a punching bag, we needed to learn how to relax more. And uh, that was especially true, I think, for me, that I was very kind of um, tense and uptight when I needed to be more loose and fluid. So, okay, I went back in week after week and um, tried to do what they said, and week after week, again, it would be the same thing. You know, you have to learn to relax, you have to relax, you have to relax, until um, one day I think I kind of just reached my breaking point and I said, you know what, I'm trying to relax. Um, at which point the coach looked at me and said, ah, there's your problem then, you're trying. Um, if we think about it for a moment, um, trying to relax is a paradox. And this can kind of reach kind of heights of ridiculousness for people who work so hard at their relaxation exercises that they end up getting more stressed out because of them. Um, learning to relax isn't about trying. Um, relaxing is, in fact, about letting go. And that's going to be one of the major themes that I'm going to talk about today um, around why people might have, some, might have difficulties getting to sleep. So I'm a psychologist by training, and I've spent quite a lot of my career studying the causes as well as the consequences of poor sleep. And one of the things that I hear uh, many people tell me, and that sleep science tells us as well, is that a lot of people who have difficulty sleeping um, get that way because they make a very similar mistake to the one that I was making in the gym, that they have all this kind of efforts and trying and striving to get to sleep when really what they should be doing is just letting go and letting their minds and bodies do what they naturally want to do. And when I see people who come for help in some of our sleep studies and talk to them and ask them, well, what are some of the things that you've done to try and help yourself with your problem, um, I hear many things around this theme. So, for example, um, intelligent smart pillows that help to track your sleep quality and tell you how you're doing every night or uh, a lot of these different supplements, so every flavor of like relaxing herbal tea that helps you to support a good night of sleep. Um, and more and more ubiquitously nowadays, uh, sleep trackers, so that people who are obsessed with data like me can wake up in the morning and go over every single minute of the night before to see how you were doing. And on top of, on top of all of this, um, a lot of people with sleep difficulties end up spending a very long time in bed to try and make up for the fact that they think that they're not getting um, good quality sleep at night. And ironically, um, you know, just like with my problem, I think this attitude of striving towards getting better sleep leads into um, really a vicious cycle that perpetuates the poor sleep itself. So people who study um, insomnia have come up with a more formal way to describe this, and they call this the 3P model of insomnia, um, which they use to describe how the disorder develops. So the first P that they talk about are um, factors known as predisposing factors. So these are things like our genetics, for example, or of our childhood environment, and that sort of gives us a baseline of risk for our development of insomnia in later life. Uh, there's not much we can do um, to change this baseline level. The second set of factors are what, is the, what are known as precipitating factors. And these refer to stressful life events where we might then experience poor quality sleep for a short period of time. So for example, undergoing an illness or perhaps losing your job or, or going through a bad separation. And again, this is something that's inevitable. Most of us are probably going to experience some kind of stress in our life. And it's perfectly normal to have a short period of bad sleep because of that. But at the same time, once that stress is removed and once we start to cope with that stress, the normal response of our body is to return again to that baseline normal level of sleep. 
Now, where we start to get into problems is where these third set of P factors comes into play. And these are called the perpetuating factors. So what happens with people who end up developing chronic insomnia are often that they start to develop these worrying thoughts about sleep itself. So for example, they might start to think, oh, if I don't start getting better quality sleep soon, I'm going to perform really badly at work, or I'm going to be in a really bad mood um, for this important meeting the next day. And it's these worries and anxieties about sleep itself that really lead um, very commonly to the development of insomnia. In addition to that, these people start to change their behavior. So they, because of the worry about their poor quality sleep, they end up spending longer and longer um, periods of time in bed. And they may extend their bedtime way into the morning or go to sleep a lot earlier or maybe take long naps during the day. And because of that, they spend a lot of time in the bed when they aren't actually asleep, but they're trying to sleep instead. Um, as psychologists, one of the things that we measure in order to try and get at these perpetuating factors is something called pre-sleep arousal. And pre-sleep arousal kind of falls out into two general categories. So the first category are what we call somatic symptoms. So these are basically feelings of being like physiologically keyed up before you go to bed. So experiencing things like racing heart, nervousness, or shortness of breath, for example. The second category of pre-sleep arousal are what we call pre-sleep cognitive arousal. And these symptoms are much more relevant, particularly for people who develop insomnia. And um, these are also symptoms I think that many of us are probably are quite familiar with. So lying in bed at night, for example, worrying about something we have to do um, tomorrow or thinking about um, some of the things that happen to us during the day. And because of having those racing thoughts, not being able to kind of switch off and get a good night of sleep. Um, or as uh, I guess Charlotte Bronte put more eloquently than me, um, a ruffled mind makes a restless pillow. <laughs> 